there's a very particular chemistry here. There's a particular set of assumptions, understanding about what life is, what everything is. Our perception of reality is very specifically constructed through the evolutionary process. I wonder if it's possible to get to some first principles, deep understanding of how life originates in such a way that you can actually construct it on other planets. I Ultimately, it, it feels like if you're doing it in a lab on Earth, you're always going to be using some aspect of the life that's already here. So uh, that's what I sort of talked about in my talk as well. And um, everyone should go watch the TED Talks. Very good. The, the annoying thing to me about TED Talks, I guess it's by design, is they're too short. It's like, <gasps> come on. <laughs> and did you know that it, there's no prompter involved? There's no, tell, wait, there is? or There isn't. Yeah, you have to memorize stuff. You're, yeah. It's a, uh, and it thanks, thanks to my gay, amazing uh, editor who probably is watching this too, David Bielo, that yeah. it was very, very helpful. But I very would say professional that. Organization. I like this podcast. It's a very professional organization. I, I, res I respect that medium. Uh, yeah, anyway, the, in the in the title talk about, yeah, life, life creating life. So it's a likely scenario that once we understand how life as a chemical system is is capable of formulating uh, its own expression and generating a memory and manages its existence on a planetary body for billions of years. Once we understand what c conditions gave rise to that, we may be very likely to understand whether a different planet also be likely to instigate its own chemical revolution if it were it was provided by through some missing ingredients so you can think of it as a sending fertilizer to a different planet that is missing its own chemical composition or lacking or that it needs more of what it has the difference between making that planet earth like which was this is this is not what that's about we're not talking about terraforming or if you're not talking about turning that planet into earth like system we are talking about first understanding that planet studying its chemistry studying its its properties well enough to understand whether it is close to its own chemical revolution and maybe giving it that extra nudge so th this is obviously a pretty big speculation and suggestion. And it's quite a very interesting proposition because this is a yes or no question, right? This is this is the ultimate would you rather. It's it's the and I think it says a lot about um uh, the perception of the person who's answering this question. That if the answer is no, 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 we absolutely not. That's not something we want to do, I want to know why that is the case. So just to be clear, what we're talking about is looking at the chemical cocktail of a particular planet. Yes. And having like tasting it and seeing uh, seeing what's missing. So having a very systematic, rigorous scientific process of understanding what is missing, not what is missing in terms of to make it Earth-like, but what is missing in order to be sufficiently uh, have the spark or the capacity of the spark to launch the uh, evolution revolution. <laughs> the evolutionary process. Exactly. And, so, And then the question is, do we want to then complete the cocktail? The proposition is to also make us think that we will likely have this capacity at some point, especially when we understand origin of life better and better, right? So we, we will be asking ourselves this question. I guess I wanted to bring this to daylight a little bit because... Uh, maybe in 10, 20 years, maybe more. So you wanted so, to ask the ethical question, should we uh, basically st start life elsewhere on another or, planet? Or enable the, 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 chemical, uh, the chemical capacity of that planet that it may one day itself get there? Okay, so for me, the answer is yes. Uh, so, if you were to try to argue against my yes, what would you say? Why not? What's the worst that can happen if we seed another planet with life? 
What are the things we should think about? Is, is your main concern a chemical biological one or is it an ethical one? What do you think about? Well, the worst thing that can happen is that it wouldn't work, right? So that it's not a uh, likely, it's not likely that an attempt like this would work. That's probably, because how you do you, so? you gotta be very, you know, you have to have an understanding that I don't think we have just yet. I see, because if it doesn't work, then we could try again, right? To me, the worst case, the thing I would be worried about is we create life. I mean, the same stuff I worry about, like with plants or is things that might have a conscious experience. And then the the dark aspect of life is life is increasingly complex life. Maybe I'm anthropomorphizing, but it seems to have the capacity to suffer. Huh. And so we're creating something. It's like when you have children, you put creatures into this world that um, will suffer, can suffer, and may suffer, depending on how you view life, may likely suffer. And so now you carry this responsibility for doing your best to alleviate any suffering they might go through. And that, that uh, perhaps that's uh, romanticizing this notion of life. Perhaps bacteria are not capable of suffering, but perhaps it'll create more complex life forms that would be able to suffer. Um, and that feels like a responsibility as well. Of course, other people would be concerned the more obvious concern is like, well, you just created a life form. How do you know it's not going to be a super deadly virus that somehow is able to hurt humans? Yeah, my, my concern is more, I feel like that's a solvable problem. The problem of creating conscious beings that are able to suffer, that's a tricky one. Yeah, I can see why. Because it goes back to, again, do, would we, first of all, um, do we ha have a responsibility to propagate more uh, of this chemistry that we have on this planet elsewhere, given that we know ultimately we will be vanished. By we, I mean the entire planet. And if this is, a, in fact, a very rare chemical event that happens because all the uh, right circumstances came together and we were the lucky one, do we have... A, a responsibility to sponsor it. This is a, if if we were to back up sponsor, I like it. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah. If, if we try to uh, back up remnants of our civilization, right? So we want to potentially create conditions on different planets so that humans can survive. Given that we know that, or we want to, just just for the sake of growing. Yeah, propagating. But, uh, becoming a multiplanetary species. Exactly. But what really is at stake here, I think it's, it's actually, or what is really more interesting is what we don't see, which is, the again, that the chemical behavior that enabled everything at first place. That's different than sending potato crops or engineering bacteria to live on a different planet. That's very different. You are really go stripping it down to what is, what is, what is possible at the chemical level. So even if you are instigating the, con uh, the co chemistry on different planets, you are letting that very planet to do its thing. Mm -hmm. You're not necessarily contaminating this planet with different chemistry because the idea behind this, at least the way I would, I, I thought about, is that you understand that planet, you understand the conditions, you understand the chemistry of the planet really well before choosing the planet as a candidate at first place. And then it's not about sending a missing ingredient per se, but again, just sending more of what it already has. This, that would be respecting that planet's condition too. So I'm not suggesting any occupation. I'm not suggesting any colonization. I'm not suggesting any, like, let's just strip everything and make everything Earth-like. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm saying. It's more about empowering that place. What you are saying is is likely to be the the motivator behind all this. Let's not because I see suffering, I see pain. It's it's very interesting. I think this is a question that really reveals about 
a lot about the person who's answering it. Well, okay, so the pushback on my pushback. If I so am deeply troubled by suffering, then I should be probably paralyzed about the history of life on Earth. And, um, you know, there's... When you, can you elaborate? What do you mean? Most of life who's ever lived suffered in ways that are almost unimaginable to me. You mean um, like your our own species? Our own species and before. And animals living today. And we're not even talking about factory farms. Uh, we're just uh, animals living in extreme poverty in the jungle. You don't, <laughs> people think like in the natural environment, animals live in a happy place. No, it's a brutal place of desperately trying to survive, of desperately trying to look for food. Yeah. And it's just like all of that life, that's just mammals. And we understand mammals, but like throughout like trillions of organisms that led up to those mammals and the organisms living everywhere, like even bacteria, there's death everywhere. So maybe this idea of death, this idea of suffering is actually, this thing that we see as a bug is actually a feature. I don't think suffering is a linear property like that with life. And I may be with Nick Lane on this one, that the likeliness of anything similar to what we got here evolving in another planetary body, I think is quite low. Where where would you say is the the biggest unlikely thing? Do you mean humans or do you mean even multicellular organisms? Probably multicellular, multicellularity. It's, uh, but I, I understand the both sides of the equation, right? In in one level, I can see that we may not have any other choice but to uh, back up this chemistry somewhere else. Yeah. So you would be saving. It's the ultimate sa saving or the record our, our own record. It's not about, you know, yes, let's also save um, Beatles and all the amazing songs, but this would be the ultimate uh, repository of life. But yeah, I, it's, I can also see your point of view, for sure. It's really interesting. So like, don't see the plan with the missing ingredient. Try to understand what the ingredients it has, is it possible to construct life? Uh, for me, for, for, uh, from a computer person, it just feels like something that could be solved computationally. We can learn from the mistakes that we've done here and aspire not to repeat them. It is possible. We, we do amazing things as humans. There's a lot of suffering, but there's also a lot of beauty. And and we we could choose what we want to be or what we want to uh, see, right? So the, the the these attempts don't need not to come from need not to come from a place of fear, but it can be ultimately can come from a piece of hope and love. I think we're just very recently figuring out stuff, like we've even just a century ago, we're doing atrocities that uh, weren't seen as atrocities at the time. I mean, I think we're learning very quickly of what is right and wrong. Yes, and I work with a lot of, maybe because I'm at the university, I get to teach young people every day, uh, even at the time of four year or three few years, you see, uh, generational difference already in unfolding in front of you. And maybe that's why I see hope because I think what we get to interact with in classrooms every year, it's just getting better. They are aware of issues in a way that I sure wasn't at their age. In some levels I was, but in many levels I didn't think about. I, I wasn't concerned of, of the problems. Well, they maybe have to be concerned because it's hitting the reality is hitting them hard, but younger people are not afraid of these things. An 18 year old can face these brutal facts about the planet in ways that I don't think any other generation before them did. Yeah, it's super cool. And and like the, uh, you know, there's all these cool technologies that aid in the process of uh, a human being, uh, being able to see the truth at deeper, deeper levels, like, you know, Wikipedia and just the internet in general is enabling education at a level that was unimaginable before the internet. Yes, and I think space exploration, uh, even contemplating about these possibilities, ultimately, and I will emphasize this again, should make us think about our own place in the universe. If we are alone, that is quite 
fascinating. And we definitely have a responsibility to guard what we got better and protect it better and don't take it for granted. If we are not the only one, that's also a lot of responsibility to understand what else is out there. So either proposition, as famously being told, is fascinating. But as a as a scientist, I think, and I think that's a general behavior, maybe not my fellow scientists listening to this can correct me if they aren't like this, but you need to have a level of optimism and, and hope it, the, that's something, you know, that things are work, worth working for, worth dreaming, worth imagining. And we cannot just have fear of suffering or fear of pain uh, stopping us from doing marvelous things. I've talked to quite a few people in my life who've, done, who've gotten a lot of shit done, have helped a lot of people. And I don't know a single one of them who's not an optimist. Now, there's a place for critics and cynicism in this world, but in terms of actually building things and creating things in this world that help a lot of people, um, I think optimism is a is, is a requirement, is a precondition in almost all cases in my limited, humble human experience. But I tend to, when I look out there, think that aliens are everywhere. I think there's, to me, I have a humility about I tend to see us humans as being very limited cognitively. Like there's so many things we don't understand. I think eventually we'll understand, of course we don't know this, but my gut says we'll understand that alien signals and life has been all around us and we're too dumb to see it. Like. Whatever life is, whatever the life force is, whatever consciousness is, whatever intelligence, whatever the the mechanism that led to the origin of life on Earth was everywhere. And we were just too dumb to see it. It's in the physics. It's somewhere, we'll find it somewhere in the physics. I think the that's one of the most is humbling parts of also being a scientist, that we know that we never know for sure. And for the outsiders, perhaps, that may be a very um, strange way of living, uh, especially when your pursuit is about creating knowledge uh, and that you'll know that what you created can also be and hopefully will be uh, disproven so that another level will rise. Um, and, th- and I think we've seen that the this lack of maybe connection between the approach to science or knowledge versus um, folks who are maybe not thinking about these problems every day, that we are okay with being wrong. That's In fact, we know that uh, that's the only way to push the limits of knowledge 